nicotine it absolutely does not cause cancer. That's been categorically proven. What causes cancer is tar. It's the burnt organic substance that's deposited in the respiratory tract when a person inhales cigarette smoke or tobacco smoke. Nicotine is a chemical which is contained in tobacco, in tobacco leaves and released in tobacco smoke, which acts on the brain and has actually a number of pleasant and beneficial effects on the brain. Nicotine itself has been known uh, about for uh, many decades, and nicotine by itself, to the best of my knowledge, has never been proven to cause disease. It does have a st slight stimulant effect though, and so of course, if a person should overdose somehow on nicotine by consuming massive doses of it, then one could imagine they could have some of the symptoms associated with overstimulation, like a rapid heart rate or an elevation in their blood pressure. But I have heard some people allege that nicotine can cause heart attacks and strokes. That has never been demonstrated in any kind of evidence-based, peer-reviewed literature. In the medical literature, you won't find anything like that. So nicotine is not what causes disease. Nicotine is what gets people addicted to smoking and using tobacco. If you can separate out the nicotine from the tobacco, then you remove the disease-causing elements in tobacco smoke. That's why nicotine products, many of them, are already approved by the FDA and available without a prescription. There are perhaps four or five different ways that you can purchase and use nicotine. If nicotine caused cancer by itself, I don't think the FDA would have approved it as an over-the-counter drug. Based on the, the research that I've been provided with and the background information that I've received from Smokestick and uh, from scientific literature, there I can't find anything that's released in smoke in the vapor that comes out of Smokestick when it's used that could cause disease. Now, let me qualify that. Many physicians would, just would talk about addiction as a disease, and I would agree with that. Addiction can be, qua, qua, can be classified as a disease, and I think the disease model of addiction is an excellent way to approach people who are addicted to the use of substances or behaviors that are harming them in some way or, or, or negatively impacting their lives. But nicotine alone, an addiction to nicotine, only causes harm in association with tobacco use. So, uh, if, if you want to play a semantics game, you can say, yes, the nicotine causes addiction or sustains an addiction that a person may have from smoking cigarettes. It doesn't solve that problem. But then the, the next logical question is, well, what's the problem with being addicted to nicotine if you're not using a tobacco product? And in my opinion, there is no problem. If I have a smoker that tells me that they've completely switched from using tobacco products to using a nicotine only product, whether it's Nicorette gum or a patch or a nasal spray or a lozenge or a device like an electronic cigarette such as smoke stick, and they can't seem to get themselves to stop using the nicotine substitute, I congratulate them on having made a healthier choice, on having made a lifestyle choice that will significantly reduce their risk of, of uh, heart disease, uh, heart attack, stroke, and there's a long list of cancers and other diseases that are, that are caused by tobacco use. One of the other very toxic chemicals that's released in tobacco smoke that has no appearance at all, is not present in, in, this, in the vapor released from a, a, nicker, a, excuse me, a smoke stick electronic cigarette, is carbon monoxide. I think most people will, will know in the general public that carbon monoxide is something that's bad for you. That's what comes out of car exhaust. That's how people who have died in, in, in accidental, you know, or, or intentional use of a, a inhalation of carbon of a car exhaust have died. Carbon monoxide is a dangerous chemical, and cigarette smoke contains carbon monoxide. The vapor released by an electronic cigarette, such as smoke stick, does not. It's a very simple vapor. After that extremely long-winded answer, the short-winded answer is: there's nothing that I know of in the vapor released from a smoke stick that has any disease-causing properties. There is a substance which is really just a substrate around which a vapor can form. The same way clouds need dust particles to form the water vapor around the dust particles, in order to form any type of vapor there has to be something around which the, for the water to condense. So the propylene glycol is the inert chemical that passes in and out of the human body without being unchanged and with no effect. 
and it's been studied as far back as 1946. I have a paper on my desk from 1946 that shows that it was studied and had no effect on human beings. The smokestick itself has three simple parts to it. There's the battery, and there's everything else. And the other two parts are right here. Those parts are, let's pull this off. The first one's the first, a, a new device is always hard to pull the first one off. This is actually not an actual, a real cartridge, it's the one just that comes as the cover and packaging in a new, a new smokestick. But this is where you have, this is what they call the cartridge. And what's left here, this part, is what we call an atomizer. So the battery activates a little heating element in here, which is next to the cartridge, heats the cartridge a little bit when the person inhales on the smokestick and produces a little puff of white vapor. Um, it, comes with, it comes with a charger and a power cord so you can, you can plug the thing in and have one of these batteries charging while you're using the other one. This will satisfy my, my desire as a doctor not to endorse uh, anything that I consider uh, to be sort of uh, a um, potential uh, conflict with my image as a health provider. But here's a cartridge which says regular no. What that means is that it's the regular flavor that, uh, that they make, but that it contains no nicotine. So let's take this cartridge with no nicotine, unwrap it, take the little plug out of it that just keeps it moist, keeps it from drying out, and put it on the smokestick. So that's ready to use. So if this battery has been charged a little bit, you ought to be able to just puff on it and create a little bit of a white puff. Let's see if we can do that. And the red light, by the way, will light up. It's the act of inhaling this through this device that, that turns on the battery and the atomizer. There you go. So it produces a little puff. Now I'm not inhaling it. One would assume uh, or might surmise that a smoker who's deciding to use this as an alternative to smoking would actually inhale the vapor. And it's not, it has a, a, a kind of a sweet taste. Uh, um, and and you can see it dissipates quite rapidly as well, very much like water vapor does. If there is a location where tobacco smoking is banned or illegal, that I don't see any reason how that how use of an electronic cigarette like smokestick would qualify for that uh, restriction. It's not tobacco. And therefore, the exposure to the, the vapor that's released when someone either puffs on or exhales the, uh, a smokestick can't harm another individual. It can't create any of the illnesses or problems that are caused by tobacco smoke. Now, I can't tell you whether or not someone might be irritated by it or take offense by it or or consider it, um, in their opinion, to be inconsistent with a smoking ban. But we're going to have to develop a new language for this because prior to the existence of electronic cigarettes, there was no such thing as non-tobacco smoke. It's unfortunate that in order for people to understand what we're talking about, we have to refer to it as smoke and smoke stick. But what we're really saying is that it's an alternative way of smoking, not that it releases smoke. Because really what smoke is, is the tarry residue and the, the, uh, the multiple chemicals that are released from the burning of an organic material. When you burn anything that is uh, a solid substance, smoke is released. Nothing is being burned in the smokestick. All that's happening is you're heating up a liquid to the point of becoming a vapor. So referring to it as smoke doesn't make sense at all. Therefore, uh, considering it uh, subject to a smoking ban doesn't really make sense either. If you're banning the act of putting something in your mouth and puffing, then I suppose you're banning this. But if what you're banning is the production of smoke, and smoke is the way I just defined it, then there's no reason that this should be subject to that kind of a restriction. A young child, and even a not-so-young child, may not necessarily be able to make the distinction between a parent who is using a smokestick and one who is using or smoking tobacco. And it's important that a parent make that choice. If they're going to use it in the presence of a child, they're going to take the risk of, or take it upon themselves and the responsibility of having to explain why they're using it, 
and maybe this is a parent who formerly used more tobacco and is trying hard to, to use less tobacco and the child wants that and the parent wants that and they explain to the child that this is a way for them to, to start to use less tobacco. So you have to have, obviously be dealing with a child that's of, a, of an age where they can start to understand that sort of a thing. Otherwise you're just modeling a smoking behavior which could be confusing to a child. As far as whether the exhaled, exhaled mist or the, uh, the mist that's produced can affect the child negatively or cause any kind of illness or disease, it's the same answer we talked about with secondhand smoke. The answer is no. There's nothing in this vapor that's harmful to a child's respiratory tract, and just the same way it's not harmful to a bystander's respiratory tract who's an adult. With Smokestick, we are not dealing with tobacco in any way, shape, or form. We are not dealing with smoke the way I define smoke, which is the gaseous residue released by the burning of a tobacco leaf or any other uh, uh, substance. There is no burning taking place. There is no combustion. There is no release of, of smoke particles, which is tars, residues, ashes uh, into the air. Therefore, how could any of that stuff wind up being impregnated into a fabric or a curtain or a rug or clothing? It can't. So, uh, yes, I'm familiar with the new information about third-hand smoke. I think it's important that we learn to recognize that that is a risk. I don't think that smoke stick in any way, shape, or form has something to do with that risk or could create that risk or contribute to that risk because, once again, the, despite the name smoke stick and, the, and if we decide to define this as smoking, it doesn't create smoke using the definition that I created for us. You know, I don't actually know, I'm not familiar with data regarding the amount of smoke and carbon monoxide released into the atmosphere and whether that's contributing to greenhouse gases and global warming and all that sort of thing. Well, the parts that I just showed you of the smokestick, in fact, here's the, here's the disposable parts that we just talked about. There's this plasticky, rubber, rubbery plastic uh, plug that comes with a, a new cartridge. There's the uh, cartridge housing itself, and there's the wrapper it came in, all of which are recyclable. And so if a person has the wherewithal or the, the sensibility to simply just stick it in their pocket until they get to a place where they can recycle it, then this is not going to contribute to the litter problem that smoking uh, that cigarette butts do. So obviously we're going to have to, we have to train people to do that, but uh, it's certainly the opportunity is there to not create additional litter because there won't be any residue from half-smoked cigarettes or cigarette butts. There's recyclable cartridges. Yeah, I think it's very viable. It's a very exciting. I think that. It is more proof of the fact that people don't smoke because they're poorly educated or unaware of the unhealthy effects of smoking tobacco. They smoke, and I actually, this is the, I'll give you an example of the conversation I have with a patient. I will say to them, listen, I understand that you're not stupid and that you understand that, that smoking tobacco is unhealthy for you. And I believe in my heart that if there was some way that you could smoke less and, and, and carry on and get some of the same gratifications or pleasures or, or uh, positive benefits that you feel you're getting from smoking, that, that you would do that. People smoke because they like it. They like the effect it has on them. Whether it's the effect of the nicotine and the fact that nicotine can be uh, uh, have some positive effects on the brain in terms of calming and concentration and alertness and uh, you know, there's a reason why people want cigarette breaks. It's not just a break from work. It's because it, it, it actually helps them relax. It's a little bit of a paradoxical effect because technically nicotine is, is thought of as a stimulant and yet it actually calms people down. Talk to a smoker and they'll tell you that. But what they want is the whole social activity that's involved, the oral activity that's involved. This is a very viable alternative to smoking tobacco cigarettes. And we need to appeal to the intelligence of the American people because they know that this is an un that smoking tobacco is an and using tobacco smokeless tobacco as well by the way also causes cancer 
this is not necessarily a, a substitute for smokeless tobacco, but if, if someone who uses smokeless tobacco is willing to try using an electronic cigarette and they find that to be satisfactory to them, then that's a healthier alternative for them as well. So I think like many politicians say, we need to give the American public credit for their intelligence, and any intelligent American knows that smoking tobacco is bad for them, and this ought to be a much healthier alternative. Among some of the concerns expressed by those who oppose electronic cigarettes or e-cigs is the fear of toxic substances emitted by these vapor devices. A new study tackles that concern. Professor Igor Burstein of the School of Public Health from Drexel University found the levels of vapor and liquid in e-cigarettes are, quote, insignificant, far below levels that would pose any health risk. Additionally, there is no health risk to bystanders. Aksha's medical director and former smoker himself, Dr. Gilbert Ross, discusses the importance of the data and his personal victory with the use of e-cigarettes. study just published last week by Professor Igor Burstein, uh, a professor at the Department of Occupational and Environmental Sciences at Drexel University School of Public Health, analyzed the uh, vapor of e-cigarettes. And uh, some folks have expressed concern that this vapor uh, might be toxic in a similar fashion to the way we now know that uh, secondhand smoke, it has been shown to be uh, somewhat toxic. So Professor Burstein's very, very comprehensive analysis of uh, uh, down to minute quantities, barely detectable quantities of uh, the constituents, the chemical constituents of e-cigarette vapor found there are no health concerns associated with the vapor. Uh, the substances that were detected in his analysis were substances that are known to be innocuous. They're not health threats. So to oppose e-cigarettes would seem logically uh, to be an effective remedy for uh, cigarette smoking, to get addicted smokers off of deadly toxic and addictive cigarettes onto something that will supply the drug they crave, nicotine, uh, in a much safer format. This seems to be a, a good way to go. Folks who oppose this for reasons uh, that are really unclear to me, it seems this is uh, counter to public health, it's antithetical to public health, it's a perversion of public health. Uh, we've seen these uh, measures cropping up in various parts of the world where they're trying to ban uh, uh, e-cigarettes or at least e-cigarettes with effective doses of nicotine. And I, I wonder why, it just makes no sense to me. And we've seen it now in California, uh, seems to be on the threshold of passing a law to effectively ban e-cigarettes. Various smaller regions around the country, we just took up this issue with Canton, Massachusetts last week. And uh, sometime within the next week or two, the measure may come up before the New York City Council, too. This is unbelievable to me, and I, I just don't understand where such measures are coming from. To read more on this story, head to our website, aksha.org.